Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. And we're very glad you are with us as well on the Three Martini Lunch today. We hope you enjoyed your three good martinis yesterday because there are none today. We have bad, bad, and crazy. And we are also brought to you today by Plexiderm. Go to triplexiderm.com and use our promo code MARTINI for 50% off plus an additional $10 off. So that's an excellent deal. Much more on Plexiderm in just a moment. So, Jim, before we get to our martinis, no, we're not going to talk about the NFL here. Today is Election Day, and it means more in some states than others. Uh, A few states are very prominent in what are considered off-year elections. Where we live in Virginia is one of them, New Jersey, Kentucky, Louisiana also, although it's not Election Day in Louisiana, but it will be uh, a little bit later on this year. So, uh, Jim, the big issue in Virginia, Republicans narrowly clinging to majorities in both chambers of the legislature. All the supposedly smart people say Democrats are going to take them, and since they already hold the governorship, uh, Democrats are going to be able to do a lot uh, in the next couple of years. We'll see about that. Big race in Kentucky. Uh, governorship there. Matt Bevin in a tight race. Uh, I really appreciated uh, listening to the radio this morning and hearing an uh, ABC analyst uh, pointing out that uh, if Democrats even come close to winning the Kentucky's governorship, it's a huge win for Democrats, even though the polls there are literally a dead heat. So um, they're also very excited about Democrats possibly uh, winning in, in Virginia. So, Jim, I actually voted early last week, so I don't have uh, too many additional anecdotes. It was fairly brisk for early voting last week. I did have a parent-teacher conference at uh, school today where the voting occurs, and I noticed that turnout was considerably quieter than it was two years ago. So I don't know what that means, but right now it looks like uh, not as many people will end up deciding what's going on. Yeah, uh, similar experience for me. Uh, I sent my son to, in a lot of jurisdictions in Virginia, the schools are actually closed today. Yes. Um, one part, the power of the teachers' unions. One part, to not have you know little old ladies trying to find their way through the halls of, a, of an elementary school while they're uh, uh, trying to get there. I did send my son to his... Um, daycare type event at school with the message to yell vote republican down the hall <laughs> grown-ups cannot electioneer inside the, the facility but you can't stop the kids um also i don't know about you greg I, I people may remember me complaining that uh there were you know there were no republicans running um for most of the offices in my jurisdiction here in authenticity woods great news though as i'm heading in there they have the democratic volunteers there they hand me the sample ballot and Greg, you observed wisely on Twitter earlier today, a lot of these offices are nonpartisan. So thanks to the Democratic Party here in my in Fairfax County, I knew exactly who not to vote for. Uh, and now I can vote against all the other candidates and hope for the best. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's amazing that the Republicans and the Democrats will give you sample ballots. That's not the amazing part. But then they'll tell you who they want in the nonpartisan races because, you know, they're nonpartisan. So... Just, just, just give them party affiliation and be done with the charade. Is uh, my uh, feeling on this, or or don't endorse one or the other. But uh, this is kind of ridiculous. But all right, let's move on to bad martini number one, and we have a new project Veritas expose. As we have uh, seen these over the years, Jim, some of these really uh, open your eyes, and other ones you're like, well, that's not really that big of an expose. This one, uh, I think, is worth uh, some discussion. Uh, It's from a supposed insider inside ABC News. Uh, Amy Robach, who, if folks watch Good Morning America, knows she does a lot of the news there. Uh, This is a point where she's not on the air, and she's kind of venting about the fact that she had done a lot of work on a story exposing Jeffrey Epstein long before he was arrested again, uh, and long before this whole federal charges thing happened and and ultimately, he was in holding and ultimately died. And, of course, if you've been on social media anytime soon, uh, Epstein didn't kill himself, has been trending all over the place. And, uh, by the way, Amy Roback doesn't think he killed himself either. But that's not the point we're going to focus on. Excuse the heartbeat uh, dramatic effect here from Project Veritas. But here's Amy Roback fuming that ABC essentially spiked her story. I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. Um, first of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, we were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate and Will that we that also quashed the story. 
Egypt, and then um, and then Alan Dershowitz was also implicated in because of the planes. So she told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I I tried for three years to get it on to no avail, and now it's all coming out, and it's like these new revelations, and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like, every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh, my God. We, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Other women backing it up. Hey, yep. Brad Edwards, the attorney, three years ago saying, like, on, like we, there will come a day when we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific pedophile this country has ever known. And, I had it all three years ago. So, Jim, that in and of itself is pretty alarming. Uh, then we have statements from both ABC and Robach, which basically suggests that uh, I think the statements clearly are bogus, but uh, they certainly fly in the face of what we just heard from Amy Robach. I think this uh, clip was from back in August. Here's the ABC News statement. At the time, not all of our reporting met our standards to air, but we have never stopped investigating the story. Ever since we've had a team on this investigation and substantial resources dedicated to it. That work has led to a two-hour documentary and six-part podcast that will air in the new year. Robach statement. As a journalist, as the Epstein story continued to unfold last summer, I was caught in a private moment of frustration. I was upset that an important interview I had conducted with Virginia Roberts didn't air because we could not obtain sufficient corroborating evidence to meet ABC's editorial standards about her allegations. My comments about Prince Andrew and her allegation that she had seen Bill Clinton on Epstein's private island were in reference to what Virginia Roberts said in the interview in 2015. I was referencing her allegations, not what ABC News had verified through our reporting. The interview itself, while I was disappointed it didn't air, didn't meet our standards. In the years since, no one has ever told me or the team to stop reporting on Jeffrey Epstein, and we have continued to aggressively pursue this important story. Jim, um, from that video, we clearly see everybody telling Amy Robach, based on her account, this is a stupid story, nobody knows who he is, stop doing this. And uh, she basically said time and time again, we had everything, we had everything. Basically, this is NBC Weinstein all over again, only Robach didn't go to another source to get the story out. Yeah, uh, you listen to all that, Greg, and I think in particular that statement uh, of saying, oh, this was just a momentary expression of frustration. Amy Robach, if you are being held hostage, blink twice. <laughs> Is she being threatened? This you know, Here's the thing. We can all understand you, you a, a hot mic get, you know, sits, puts you in a situation where it makes your bosses look bad. And you don't want to make your boss look bad and maybe you feel like you're Maybe your job's at stake, maybe your reputation's at stake or something like that. But here's the thing. I don't believe that that's just her spouting off. I believe every word she's saying as she says that, um, again, you know, she, she doesn't know she's being recorded. She's, you know, she's venting. Maybe she's exaggerating when she says she has everything, I suppose. But I'd love to know who at ABC News was saying, oh, this isn't ready. Oh, this isn't big enough. Oh, this isn't important enough. Um, but I noticed, Greg, that word, Cl- we had Clinton. That, that seems like a really big deal to me, Greg. <laughs> yes. um, and I should point out, uh, since it is the t- time of year, oh, but by the way, the idea of, oh, don't worry, we're going to get this with a two-part documentary coming out next year. It's November 5th. They're, they're going to have a Star Wars movie out before then. What, is it taking more time for the computer graphics and the Epstein tape? Well, how, they, oh, oh, don't worry, we've got something coming in January? You'd kind of like to think that this would get, you know, like the, the stakes of this. And the idea that, look, yes, you know, because you know, say Epstein uh, is, is dead. By the way, Greg, how is uh, Jeffrey Epstein like your house's Christmas lights? Oh. Neither one's going to hang themselves. <laughs> we laugh because otherwise we would cry. Um, True. Jeffrey Epstein may be dead, but it sounds like there are lots and lots of people involved in this. And you would think we'd want to say, hey, let's get everybody who was involved with this. If it was any of these high profile names in politics and legal circles and all that stuff, let's get every last one of them. Who at ABC News is looking at all this and saying, nah, not a big story. Because we now know, because of the situation with Lauer, we now know because of the situation with Ronan Farrow, at least one glaring case in which a major network news division ignored and downplayed a story because they felt it came a little too close to their own internal scandals of, of bad behavior and sexual predators. This is, you know, it's, it's very tough for the rest of us not to jump to the absolute worst conclusions or, or, or possibilities out of this. 
to summarize it well, Greg, I think it was the Babylon Bee who reported yesterday, uh, some nutty conspiracy theorist is now claiming that uh, Epstein killed himself. <laughs> Well, there's two things that stand out here to me, one of which is stated and one of which is not. Number one, uh, I, I kind of built respect for Amy Robach uh, in listening to this, maybe a little bit less so after reading her statement, which contradicts everything she said. But the obvious disgust in her voice that ABC clearly, in part, killed this story because they wanted to do a profile of Will and Kate and uh, make the make the uh, the royal family happy was just mm. absolutely nauseating. And secondly, this story comes at the exact same time that the lieutenant governor of Virginia is suing CBS News for airing the interview of two accusers. And Robach had at least two, if not more, for this story. And CBS News has uh, not only ran that story, they're looking at this lawsuit and saying, game on, Justin Fairfax, let's rock. And uh, very yeah. two very different reactions here. It's really weird. And look, the, the suspicion is, is that, you know, the, the difference there is that Justin Fairfax is only, I make air quotes as I say that, the lieutenant governor of Virginia. But Epstein's uh, friends and associates are some of the biggest names and most powerful people. And, you know, he didn't go to Harvard, but he wrote big checks to Harvard. So Harvard University was, you know, happy to, you know, fully embrace him and all that stuff. But we also still have to figure out where he got his money. Have we, Greg? No. Well, apparently from blackmail, if you listen to Amy Robach later on in the day. <laughs> right? I, I mean, like, now all of a sudden this becomes a little bit clear. So anyway, so look, clearly there's still a lot more investigating to do here. Um, I suppose you say the good news. First of all, you know, hats off to James O'Keefe. As you mentioned, there are some videos that are a little less exciting than others, but this one feels like a bombshell. This should be a huge story, uh, and we will see if it ends up becoming that. And if it doesn't become a huge story, it would indicate the same people who did not think that this was a big deal back then are still running news divisions at the networks today. All right, let's cleanse the palate here and talk about something good for a moment, since we have no actual good martinis, and that's Plexiderm. Picture your face in the mirror. And if you're an ABC News executive, you need to spend <laughs> a lot of time looking in the mirror and not just at wrinkles and crow's feet and uh, those bags under the eyes. Although the longer this story goes, those are going to start developing, I have a feeling. Okay, You're, now... you're staring at the devil looking back at you in the mirror and saying, good job. That's right. It's the portrait of Dorian Gray in real time, apparently, over there at ABC. OK, so now imagine those things are gone and we're not talking about getting rid of them through risky, expensive surgery. We're talking about making them gone in just minutes. It's called Plexiderm, a clinically studied serum that visibly eliminates your wrinkles, your crow's feet and under eye bags in just minutes. This is the edge you've been looking for. Don't believe it. Just wait until you see the results. If you want to look 10 years younger... Try Plexiderm. You will look rejuvenated, and simply put, you will be blown away by the results. Plexiderm can give you the confidence you need to be yourself at work or out with friends. And the best part is Plexiderm goes on clear, so nobody will know you're using it. Now go to TryPlexiderm.com and use our promo code MARTINI for 50% off plus an additional 10 bucks off. That's right, 50% off plus an extra $10 off. This offer is also available by calling 1-800-685-1292 and mentioning Martini. Plexiderm is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. Visit TryPlexiderm, that's T-R-Y-P-L-E-X-A-D-E-R-M.com today and use the code Martini at checkout. TryPlexiderm.com. All right, Jim, on to our second bad martini now. And anytime we've talked about the border, we've talked about the challenges posed by the cartels. They're the ones often smuggling people across. They're smuggling drugs across. And they're the main reason that the border is as dangerous as it is. And now we have uh, a lot of dead Americans as a result, it appears, of cartel violence. This is from USA Today. At least 10 members of a prominent Mormon family, three mothers and their young children, were killed in a shooting attack relatives suspect might have been a case of mistaken identity by drug cartel gunmen. About a dozen family members remain missing. The victims were U.S. citizens and members of La Mora, a decades-old settlement in Sonora State founded as part of an offshoot of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's located about 70 miles south of Douglas, Arizona. The mothers were driving from Basvipe, I hope I'm saying that right, to a wedding in La Baron, another Mormon community in the state of Chihuahua, when their three vehicles loaded with children were attacked by gunfire, causing one of the vehicles to explode in flames. So, Jim, this is nothing new. We have politicians, we have journalists routinely murdered by the cartels. There were reports not long ago that the Mexican army actually lost a battle against the cartels. 
in response to this news, you got President Trump saying, hey, Mexico, just tell us when and where you want some help and our military will be there. Some folks are saying it's not quite that simple because a lot of politicians are on the take of the cartels. So, Jim, this is a big problem that doesn't get nearly enough attention. It doesn't. Hopefully this will get at the attention. Um, I, I, you know, I'd seen the, I think I saw the president's tweet before I'd actually seen this news, and it really is just the nightmare scenario. Uh, look, we, they are our neighbors, and there are always going to be a significant number of Americans who travel to Mexico for tourism, because of the beaches, because of the uh, pretty small towns. People can be traveling there for business, for trade. You know, on the one hand, we may all believe, oh, well, it's national sovereignty, and you know, let them solve their own problems or something problems that Mexico has are inevitably going to spill over onto our border, whether or not we ever get the border fencing completed. I think it's safe to say Mexico needs our help on this. Now, we've been fighting the drug war. We've been trying to deal with the cartels going back to at least the 90s, going into the 80s. Um, But you look at the problem and the challenge presented by the drug cartels. And then look at the problem and the challenges presented by, let's say, ISIS circa 2013, 2014, 2015. We've really done a lot of damage to ISIS. Obviously, the, the raid about Baghdadi, Baghdadi got a lot of attention a couple weeks ago. But, you know, the, the eventual slow dissolution of the Islamic State, the ability to find allies on the ground. If we can do that to ISIS, we should be able to do this to drug cartels. It might involve different tactics, but we do have enormous technologies available to us. We have the best trained troops. We have best trained law enforcement. Um all we need, as it sounds like, is a little more cooperation with the Mexican government. And look, I completely understand that. In fact, I wrote about this at length in the, the novel. Probably the most shocking statistic I, I came across was somebody said, when you add up all the, the various foot soldiers of the drug cartels, all the gangs, everybody involved in distribution, every able-bodied male that they have, it may very well be a number comparable to the Mexican army. Um, depending on how you go about this, you have the potential to start effectively a, a civil war. The other line that was in the book that people enjoyed and that was reasonably true is that, look, you could argue with the Mexican, whether the cartels actually run Mexico. And the reason they are not the functioning government is because they don't want to run the public pension systems. But you know, in, ter- in terms of who actually runs Mexico in some places, you know, it's very clear the cartels run things. I think when it starts spilling over like this, we have no choice. We have to start doing more. Um, but the fact that we've been able to have this kind of success against menaces as varied as Al Qaeda and ISIS and further away in the world and, and, you know, tied into religious extremism, we should be able to put these guys out of business. Um, and hopefully we will begin, uh, begin mobilizing on that in a greater capacity soon. I certainly hope so. And uh, you, you see the, the need there and uh, you kind of feel an exhaustion sometimes when you see other hotspots flaring up around the world where the U.S. doesn't have a presence yet and you're just wondering if we can uh, afford the, the resources and the, and the time and the manpower and everything. But this one's right on the other side of the border, in many cases on our side of the border, uh, given all the smuggling that they're doing. So I'm certainly not an expert enough to know what the, what the right strategy is here, but uh, doing nothing uh, certainly doesn't seem to be doing much at all. All right, let's move on to our crazy martini now, Jim. And yesterday, the Washington Nationals visited the White House with President Trump, uh, a couple days before, one of their relievers, Sean Doolittle, who's uh, an avowed lefty, uh, announced he wasn't coming to the White House, doesn't like Trump, doesn't think he's inclusive enough, and he got glowing coverage uh, for that. A uh, number of others ultimately didn't come either, but the majority of the team was there. And uh, so it seemed like a fairly normal uh, championship event at the White House. And then the president called up a few people from the team to... Uh, to the podium to say a few words. And one of them was Kurt Suzuki, who's one of the catchers, hit a big home run uh, in game two of the World Series to break that open. Uh, And he's uh, had a couple of clutch moments elsewhere in the postseason. And Kurt Suzuki walks up and puts on a MAGA hat. Trump hugs him from behind, almost like the Titanic pose uh, with uh, Kate Winslet and Leo DiCaprio. And as soon as that happened, you just knew that uh, liberal Twitter and the liberal columnists were Going to have a field day here, but uh, Christine Brennan of USA Today, who's a sports columnist who manages to almost never actually write about sports, but how uh, sports is, is, is lagging behind the liberal culture is usually what her shtick is. Uh, for example, with the 100th anniversary of the NFL recently, she was appalled that Jim Brown made the list because he's been accused and 
uh, credibly, she believes, of domestic abuse over the years. So because of that, he shouldn't be considered one of the greatest hundred football players of all time. Uh, But here's part of her column about uh, the Nats appearance yesterday. Oh, and by the way, Ryan Zimmerman gave Trump a jersey and thanked him for keeping us safe and keeping America the greatest place to live on Earth. So she says after their majestic run through October, when the Nationals won the World Series by doing just about everything right, they couldn't get through the first four days of November without making a huge error by apparently not cautioning their players, manager and general manager to avoid politics at their White House celebration Monday afternoon. A photo of catcher Kurt Suzuki wearing a bright red Make America Great hat, which can only be described as an aggressively partisan gesture while receiving a behind-the-back bear hug from a delighted President Donald Trump will become the day's enduring image. The Nationals and MAGA are now linked for as long as people remember this White House visit, which, this being Washington, could be a very long time. What's more in the video, capturing the moment in which Trump calls Suzuki to the podium, it's not only the president who appears thrilled. Manager Dave Martinez, and I love this parenthetical split, born in Brooklyn to Puerto Rican parents, also laughed and clapped joyfully while General Manager Mike Rizzo was caught by a microphone trying to preempt the surprise by telling Trump that Suzuki had a MAGA hat, meaning Suzuki's stunt had definitely been in the works. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it, these are your 2019 Washington Nationals, some of them anyway. They have the right to be partisan, but to do so on such a visible and public stage during what has traditionally been a nonpartisan celebration is both noteworthy and risky. I could go on here, Jim. This is just an SJW opus magnum here. She calls Sean Doolittle thoughtful in deciding not to be there. She calls everybody who didn't come, uh, said they had, that was a very good look for them. So after all the media cackling about Trump being booed at Nats Park during Game 5, Now we get this entirely predictable response to the celebration at the White House. What do you make of it? You had tweeted about this earlier today, Greg, and I think you had exactly the right take, which is that whatever your your viewpoint is, be consistent, right? If your attitude is shut up and dribble, I don't want to hear about uh, uh, athletes and, and, you know, non-political celebrities engaging in politics at all. Fine. That's fine. You know, I, I completely get that. I relate to that. If you are perfectly comfortable with athletes being outspoken about one political point of view, then, then fine. You should be comfortable with them speaking out from another political point of view. I have a theory, though, Greg. I think this bothers folks on the left a lot more than it bothers folks on the right. I would defend this argument by saying, if you're a conservative, you're just used to everybody in Hollywood and, and maybe some you know, outspoken professional athletes, certainly the NBA, probably less likely in uh, baseball or football, you're just used to seeing people disagree with you. And so when you come across, let's say, you know, Adam Baldwin being an outspoken concern, hey, remember Jane from Firefly? I love that show. Or, or Casey from, from oh, he's a conservative. That's awesome. Right? It's, it's a pleasant little surprise because you're used to seeing, you know, you know, your average celebrity say, wouldn't the world be different if whales could vote? <laughs> Yeah, but they can't. So <laughs> why are we spending much time thinking about this scenario? You know, that, that you're used to getting. You know, and, and if you if you really get upset about celebrities that believe that the right to vote should be extended to whales, well, then you're not going to watch a lot of movies or watch a lot of TV shows. You you just kind of accept the fact that there are a whole bunch of celebrities and actors and professional athletes who are liberal, and yeah, that's fine because you're not there for you know you only get really irritated when it starts turning into heavy-handed messaging and movies and TV shows or, or, you know, maybe like the the kneeling during the national anthem or something like that. It's fine. If you're a liberal, you're used to encountering people who agree with you and to run into somebody who disagrees with you, you know, that that all of a sudden the hair is on fire because you, how dare he, right? I thought you were a good person. I cheered for all your home runs. And now you have the audacity to disagree with me politically. What, What it comes is like, if you're a conservative, you're constantly, you might, my guess is you're constantly encountering people who you like, and I'm kind of making air quotes when I say this, maybe I don't, but like, you know, you, you, you appreciate uh, musicians and actors and professional athletes outside of the realm of politics. So when they disagree with you, it's like, eh, well, you know, bummer. You know, you don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it. Whereas if you're a, a you know, left or center sports writer, a, a professional athlete being on the right or being supportive of this particular president you know, it's as if your world has exploded. And obviously, look, well, you know, Washington, D.C. is a very liberal town. I, obviously, the fan base of the Nationals extends well beyond the city into the suburbs. 
But I think it's safe to say that the fan base of the Nationals is probably a bit more liberal than, than conservative, although I don't think it's quite as lopsided as the uh, coverage might have suggested. Um, and result, you know, go, some you know, they go to the White House, some of them hug the president, some people are going to like it, some people won't. You know, it does say something, that something that was always seen as a relatively apolitical event uh, in past years has now turned into this partisan football where athletes need to tell us, oh, I'm staying home and I'm not going to be seen with this president. There are a lot of presidents I vehemently disagreed with, Greg. I can't imagine a lot of circ- – if you get invited to the White House and somebody wants to say good job, man, there's not a lot of presidents I would not go there and have my picture taken, take the handshake, and you know, hear the thank job. Because if, if, if no other reason, Greg, you get to visit the White House. Right. <laughs> That's really nice. It's really neat. <laughs> have you never met someone who you're not particularly big fond of or, or had to hang around with someone you disagree with, but you know, you got to kind of – so, I mean, again, now all of a sudden, Greg, I understand why these people have such a hard time at Thanksgiving. <laughs> I guess so. And I also tweeted out a couple of things yesterday where when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup, I think it was about 2010, their goalie didn't like Obama's policy, so he decided not to go. He wasn't considered thoughtful like Sean Doolittle. Uh, he was uh, absolutely pilloried for thinking of himself instead of his team. He wasn't specifically invited. Uh, this is being very selfish on his part. But uh, the thing that I just want to go back to this point in in the Christine Brennan thing. Manager Dave Martinez, born in Brooklyn to Puerto Rican parents, also laughed and clapped. Jim, the implication there is you are from Brooklyn and have Puerto Rican parents. How dare you be happy in this moment? Yeah, exactly. Kind of like your parents must be ashamed of you. (laughs) You're on the wrong side demographically. Shape up, Martinez. Yeah. Just you don't know what it's. Let, let Sally's going to tell you what it takes to be a real Puerto Rican. <laughs> oh, Christine Brennan. She knows a lot about figure skating. That's about the only time she ever talks about actual sports. The rest of it's always, uh, why can't we be more woke? It's very tiresome. But uh, good for the crazy martini today. So, Jim, I'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll never run out of material, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thank you so much for being with us today. If you've done already, please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast and also give us a nice five-star review over at iTunes if you enjoy the podcast. We've mentioned Twitter a couple times. You can follow both of us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.